Uh, my name is Roy Keyes. I'm going to be the moderator for this session. And um, I am a data scientist at a local company called Arundo, as well as a co-organizer of the uh, Houston Data Science uh, Meetup Group, which I encourage you to look up on meetup.com if you come to some of our interesting meetups. And we're going to have some good talks today about tools and infrastructure related to data science, machine learning. We have a lot of uh, deep learning stuff going on. And our first speaker is Anshu Srivastava from Rice University, a professor. And I'm going to let him take it away. All right. Thanks for coming. So uh, what is going on? Let me go to. OK, so I'll be talking about some of my recent experiments and how we can design a really large scale deep learning system. And this is joint work with uh, PhD student Ryan Spring. So I mean, uh, this, is, uh, this picture is pretty much clear, and it's been there in most of the deep learning talk, that uh, if we are in a low data region, then you know, models behave differently. But when we have lots and lots of data, that is really when we start to see an improvement in the accuracy. And uh, you know, traditional machine learning models have low capacity, so they kind of saturate quite early. But you, know, you need really large models. And there is kind of a consensus on what we are seeing that we need more data, we need large models, and we need tons of engineering. And then there is this, uh, you know, the magical algorithm called backpropagation, which is also a gradient descent. And we can really push things on this front. That is where we want to be. Now, uh, you know, the, there are a couple of lessons learned. Uh, so in statistics, people know pretty much this, that essentially all models are wrong. But I think after what we are seeing recently, we can be a little more precise is that given any modeling assumption for a problem, if we get large enough data, it will be violated almost surely. And basically what deep learning has shown us is that, OK, you know, as data grows, for example, if we are in 2012, I probably need a deep learning with 17 layers. If I have more data, then maybe 152 layers. So as your data grows, scrape your own models and get a bigger one, and better than the alternatives that we know so far. And it's interesting that a very similar kind of phenomena was reported right, by Condorcet in around 1700. And the statement says that all that is necessary to reduce the whole, world, whole of nature to laws similar to those which Newton discovered with the aid of the calculus is to have a sufficient number of observation and a mathematics that is complex enough. And this is almost true even today if we just replace this calculus with backpropagation and this mathematics with deep learning. You know, that is, that is uh, you know, it's, uh, it's strange, but you know, this is what uh, we are seeing. So one common complaint with deep learning is that it requires lots and lots of data. Well, there has been, you know, a lot of ideas and work around that, and one simple solution is to use other data. And what that means is, so this is actually a picture from a paper in 97, 20 years before, and what says is that, okay, if I have task one, let's say I want to predict diabetes, obesity, cancer, and other stuff, then this is how I will build models, and each train individually on different data. But rather, what you should be doing is something like this. Train a bigger model, feed everything in, and predict all the tasks simultaneously. And what that means is that the gradients from this task will help this task, because there's a common representation. And what they, what they showed is that there is, if you do this, then you get accuracy, which is superior on all the tasks, because you have this one representation. And intuitively, this is what it is, right? You know, if I have a common, you know, a common belief which works at 10 different places, then most likely it is a generic belief rather than having a specific beliefs. You know, like, and this was 97. And in 2017, Google used pretty much the same concept and showed that you can actually design, you know, towards a generic AI where they designed a very massive scale neural network that would take text, images, audio, everything, fuse them into one model, and train them simultaneously together. And the idea is similar that you know, we want to have a generic representation which can work across all tasks. And so you know, you, it was also called one model to learn them all. And the name itself says what, what they were up to. Now, I mean, a bit, if you're an information theorist, here is a very simple argument that if you want one model you know, to know all the knowledge, so if I assume that there is this one big, one network which has all the knowledge in the world, it better be large. I mean, basic information theory says that you cannot compress all the information out there into a small network. 
So you need larger and larger networks, and that is consistent with what we are observing. We get better and better accuracy with larger and larger models. And well, uh, last year Google reported a 137 billion parameter networks. And you know, this is this all tells you where is this all going. You know, we 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 are we are very, you know, good in generating lots and lots of data, but we need really humongous model to make sense out of it. And this seemed to be the right way because that is what we are seeing. Uh, you know, you know, the breaking all the benchmarks and stuff. So I mean, this is actually pretty fascinating because we are in a much better position than in the past. So if you look at what all different models are saying from speech, text, images, we are kind of getting a consistent feedback that we know what kind of model will work, right? It should be some sort, maybe a deep net or you know, some complex model. And uh, we don't have to rely on a lot of domain expertise. We, do, we, have, we, we can work with very, very minimal model, modeling assumptions. And it seemed to work for a variety of data set. And in fact, we also know how to combine multiple information. So the problem of this multimodal learning is also seeing a quite a bit progress, as in that we can successfully train models from you know, a variety of data sets. And uh, to add to the simplicity, there are now several easy packages which you can run and you know, see you know, all these things working on your, on your machine. And well, somebody will argue that there are engineering challenges. I mean, what is the right model? What is the right size of the models? I think uh, that is actually a very good question. And there are you know, like, uh, progress in that direction. So for example, Google and other companies are designing deep reinforcement learning to automatically select the model. So this is fantastic. I mean, uh, you know, it's like if we really care about the progress, this is what is driving the progress. And we kind of know a high level recipe to make things work. So where is the catch? And well, it's, it's in computations. So there is no free lunch. I mean, we can get lots of data. We need lots and lots of model. And there is nothing like, what is the right size? The bigger, the better. And obviously, therefore, we are, the, uh, we are hitting the limit of you know, computations. So if you look at uh, you know, the backpropagation, it's actually very, very slow. And if you have played with backpropagation, try teaching, a, you know, just learning a game of Pong using deep reinforcement learning. You will need GPUs. It's a simple network, but still it will, it will take days to train it. I mean, if you are working with ImageNet, which is a big data set, it takes around a week to get a good accuracy, uh, to get the state of the art accuracy with one GPU. And we are talking about something that can capture all the data. It, it, so backpropagation is actually very slow. It's also hard to parallelize because there are the, uh, the iterates are serial. So we observe a data, update the parameter, then we observe another data, update the parameter, and then it's not really clear if we can parallelize things. Now memory is a concern which you would, it's much severe concern than what you will think. And if you just want to see what, what is happening, there is there are public data set called open directory project. So basically it gives you a text and you have to predict the category and the broad level category, and the number of categories are only 100,000 classes. So there are 100,000 possible categories, and it has 400,000 features. Now forget about deep learning. A simple logistic regression will require 400,000 into 100,000 weight weights. And that is more than 300 gigabytes of model size. And this is a publicly available data set. So I'm not talking about any fancy industrial scale data set. This is publicly available. If you want to train a simple logistic regression, this is not going to happen easily. And basically what is happening is, because of this scale, you know, the algorithms are not same as what we used to think about them. Even linear is becoming hard. I mean, this is linear. This is linear complexity. I'm just having one weight vector for every feature for every class, and that's, that's the model size, and it's a public data set. And we are seeing this now, and future is going to be a lot worse. Now, backpropagation is slow because we have 137 billion parameters. How much space that is? That's, that's a lot of gigabytes. I mean, we need sophisticated hardware to tame them, and you know, it's not the same algorithms that we are used to will work at that scale. And therefore, you know, it's a, you know, if you really want to go at that scale, the current backpropagation seems hopeless. And, you know, and one of the reasons why it took five years for ImageNet to go from accuracy of 16% to 3% is because it still is hard to train. I'm pretty sure if you can train ImageNet in five minutes, then you will, get, you will see the same, you know, same uh, you know, jump within a few months. 
And that is because trial and error is reality. I mean, you, you basically try a model. Uh, as an analyst, you try a model, train it, see how, whether it works or not, and then refine your models, refine your assumptions, and work. This is the reality of you know, uh, you know, doing data science. And imagine you have a model, you train it, and it crashes after a week or two weeks. And you realize, oh, damn, I didn't fix this particular bug, and my weeks are lost. And basically, you don't want to be something like this. And that is why you know, scalability is a, is, you know, is a major hurdle that is stopping our you know, like, uh, progress in, in, in data science. So I mean, we need to really think, rethink about backpropagation completely. And I have just uh, listed down you know, a couple of reasons. Prohibitively slow training. Requires expensive clusters. Not everybody can afford it. Prohibitive memory and energy. So if you are talking about IoT and other embedded devices, we are not really clear how we can do it. One solution seems like, OK, send everything to the cloud and let it do it. But then it's not private, and it's not also sustainable. And well, this is also uh, consistent with what you know, the pioneers in the field are thinking. This is an article which was uh, you know, a couple of months ago is that you know, they say, my view is to throw it all away and start again. Because backpropagation does not seem like the right algorithm. All right, so uh, you know, like just uh, let me go a little bit into the technicalities. So a backpropagation is this simple algorithm which takes the input, then you compute the activation, which is a matrix multiplication, compute the output, compute errors, backpropagate, which is again a matrix multiplication. Now, matrix multiplication is, you know, it's a, it's a basic operation, but it's not easy, especially if you are talking about giant networks like billion-sized neurons. OK, so the time complexity is cubic. You know, even n square is too bad. And uh, there are potential solutions. Like, one thing is you can think about is like, OK, this is just one layer of matrix multiplication. Let me think of low rank matrix multiplication. So what, what it essentially says is that this matrix is decomposable into two smaller matrices. And basically, all you have to do is to replace this architecture with an architecture like this, and you save something. But this is not really going to go far, because you know, this, uh, this is only a factor improvement of the rank. We don't know how the approximations are. And uh, you know, this is hard to scale. And by scale, I mean I really want to exploit parallelism, because if I'm not exploiting parallelism, most likely I'm not solving your problem. OK, so yeah, I, I mentioned the gradients are dense. It's hard to parallelize, and you know, pure, poor accuracy due to approximation. So what is the hope here? The hope is what I call, you know, it's, it's, it's called information sparsity. So imagine I, have a, imagine I have a billion, you know, billion neurons. I mean, if I'm looking at an image of a cat, it's not, it's an image of a cat is unlikely to change my belief about all the neurons. It's only going to few pick, rel, pick relevant neurons and change, change my belief, change my belief about them. So essentially, a, a pattern is only going to activate few neurons, and then you can only backpropagate on them. And that is what you know, has been found recently to work. So if you look at the process, this is how it looks like. So let's say these are all my neurons. Then first you compute the activation. Then you pick the node with the large activation. And then you only backpropagate and forward propagate only on these neurons. And so if you're looking at a billion node, you can only pick 100 of neurons and work with them. And that seemed to work fairly well. There are you know, a, couple, a lot of literature on showing that this is as good as your usual training. But uh, you know, the good is it seemed like we are selecting a sparse, sparse set of expert neurons. But it's bad because it requires computing all the activation first. So I'm picking only a few neurons, and I'm throwing away everything else. But I'm computing the activation of all the neurons that I have thrown away, right? So that, that, that seems quite wasteful. And so this is where you know, uh, we can be smart. And if you think properly, it's like a search problem in disguise. Given a query, I want to search for the neurons which are likely to activate on this. And search is one operation that we know is efficient. I mean, I can search over terabytes of data in a fraction of a second. There's been 30 years of research in doing that. So why can't we exploit that? So you know, this, this neural network now behaves like a web, because we have 137 billion kind of parameters. And I, only want, I know only a few of them are relevant, given the pattern. Now, this is very different from you know, the usual sparsity that we are used to, in, for example, in Lasso. So in that, the sparsity is that there are only few features which are responsible. Here it's different. Every pattern only activates a small set of neurons, 
but they can be different across patterns. So I need this large neurons, but not every input, for example, in stochastic gradient descent, will activate all of them. And that's where you can, you know, like there are a couple of uh, technical results that actually the search process in finding the large activation neurons, you can show that it is efficient, and you can sample those neurons in, you know, roughly near constant time. And well, we, we use the concept of indexing, which is also why your search engines work faster to do that. And instead of, you know, so in hash functions, instead of throwing, you know, we, instead of having data in your hash tables, we throw neurons in your hash table. So here's how the process looks like. So this is your, your this is the network that we want to train and test. So input, we have to compute the activation, and then finally the output. So first, we reorganize this neurons into hash tables. So these are, you know, some sort of a, you know, like a near neighbor or locality sensitive hash tables. Then we take the input, compute it hash, go to a particular bucket, and I see, oh, these are the neurons in my bucket, so only those will remain active. And similarly for the other layer. So I got the sparsity pattern in few memory lookups. So again, this is bringing back the tensor to something like tables, which database people and systems know how to deal with. And uh, this is also, I'll say, like our memory, because when I look at a pattern, I don't have to, you know, like scan all my memory past and say, oh, where have I seen this guy? It just flashes, oh yeah, I have seen it at this particular time, at this is, and this is precisely like this. My input decides from a memory lookup which neurons are going to be active. And of course, Hashing can have bad collisions, and that is even true with, with our mind. All right, so, I mean, I remember I talked about low rank not being paralyzable, but this is great because sparsity is paralyzable. So pattern one is responsible for 100 neutrons, pattern two is responsible for another 100 neurons, but if I have a billion neurons, these 100 and 100 are unlikely to overlap. And so I can update them in parallel. I can learn from both the patterns in parallel. And that is what is the idea of doing asynchronous gradient descent. Well, how it works? So first of all, how sparse can we make the networks? So this is an experiment done on 1,000 node, nodes per layer, and we have two hidden layers. On the x-axis, we have how much sparsity. So one means using full computation, and zero means no, uh, none at all. The black dotted line is the usual neural network that you would train. This pink line is the adaptive, uh, is, is a dropout. So you randomly remove, so you pick the sparsity pattern randomly, and as we know, it kind of works at 50% because that's the usual dropout. But the blue line is actually when you use these hash tables. And you can see that roughly around 5%, we are more or less the same accuracy as that of the actual neural network. Now that is great. And uh, if you look at the convergence, so this is like a process running the usual neural network with 56 processor and running this sparse hash table based adaptation with 56 processors. Sometimes it's okay to just, you know, let things, you know, like paralyze. In, on some data set it's fine, but not on others. Whereas, you know, with sparsity and random, random paralyzation, we get speed up. And this is how the speed up looks like as you increase the number of processor, the wall clock times goes down. And well, the uh, short story is random and sparse are easy to scale. Uh, so you know, this is the direction that I am currently obsessed with: is that there are only very few operations which are fast at terabyte of scale. Search is one of them. Can we recast most of the hard part in machine learning iteration as a search problem? And we are seeing some other success in you know, uh, getting better estimates for stochastic gradient descent. We can also do fast Monte Carlo estimations. We have some report online. Well, I, have to, I haven't talked about memory, but uh, th that's another direction that we are pursuing, is if you have a large output space, like if the number of classes are big and the features are big, then the state of the art requires distributed computing and achieves 9% accuracy. With hashing, we can get 17% accuracy in less than five gigabytes of model on a single machine. So if you're thinking that hashing is doing some sort of approximation, yes it is, but approximations are good for generalization. I mean, there is, a, there is a, this weird interplay between machine learning and approximations. So you know, that, that, that is why we can even get much better accuracy. We are also interested in you know, how we can do with ultra high dimensional data sets. So for example, if you're looking in genomics with 100 billion dimensions, a model itself is very, you know, 
very big. Now, we have random projections and other dimensionality reduction, but they are not explainable. So you loses which, it loses which feature should I, you know, uh, are responsible, which is important in, you know, important in uh, medical domain. So we can actually work with both explainability and only using logarithmic memory in the dimension. And the answer seem to be yes in many domain. And having said that, I'll say that this is the most exciting time to work on large scale learning because the rules of the game have changed. It's like rewriting the history because everything has changed. There will be new winners and you know, a new set of algorithms are going to show up. And hopefully I have shown you that there is a significant room for improvements by bridging fundamental ideas. Uh, let's thank Anshu.